Welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism. This is Jay. In this episode, we interview Tammy Kovich and L. Jones to discuss the book Anti-Fascism Against Machismo, published by our good friends at Chris Blebedev and described as, quote, an intergenerational dialogue on the meaning of feminist anti-fascism, anti-fascism against machismo, collects and continues a conversation begun by Tammy Kovich as Petronella Lee in 2019. Four feminist anti-fascist revolutionaries jump off from each other's reflections and bring the particularities of their varied context to bear on one central problem. What has and will a woman's war against fascism look like? We pick up this conversation with Tammy Kovic, who wrote the original zine upon which the book is constructed, as well as L. Jones, who wrote the introduction. The book itself also includes contributions from Veronica L. and the late great Butch Lee, who became an ancestor in 2021, and who we all spend a good bit of time honoring in this conversation. Among other things, we discuss different variants of fascist or far-right patriarchy and misogyny, the problems of the politics of representation and neocolonialism, and histories of resistance of women in anti-fascist movements, including in Ethiopia, Yugoslavia, and Spain. I will add that we recorded this conversation back in August, and I am sure that if we had recorded it after October 7th, we would have talked about what an anti-fascist war against Zionism might look like and the contributions of women and children in the Palestinian struggle against genocide, as well likely as struggles in Congo, in Haiti, and in Sudan. We very much appreciate this book and encourage folks to pick it up from Chris Blevedeb's retail arm, which is leftwingbooks.net. It is currently 40% off for the month of March, along with over 400 titles at their online bookstore. If you appreciate the work that we do, becoming a patron of the show or increasing your pledge to the show, if you can afford to do so, are the most meaningful ways you can help us keep it going. We would not be able to bring you these episodes on a weekly basis and the live streams we put out multiple times per week without the support of our listeners and viewers. We also will be starting a new study group in April, and the best place for you to find out more about that and track everything we release is to become a patron of the show for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash millennials are killing capitalism. So we're here to talk about the book Anti-Fascism Against Machismo. And Tammy, if you would, could you say a little bit about the original intervention you were seeking to make with the zine and perhaps... You could start to introduce yourself and talk about what brought you to writing the original piece and what were some of the key things you were looking to address. Yeah. So my name is Tammy. I'm a longtime anarchist organizer from Canada. I'm also a feminist. So feminist issues are something that are important to me. In terms of what brought me to writing the piece, a number of different factors at the time I was concerned watching, as with many people, watching the increase in the rise of the right and different political trends that were happening there and seeing a lot of the obviously intense racism, intense white supremacy, but also the intense misogyny and different patriarchal elements that were happening at once. So that was an issue of my concern at the same time. I was sort of disappointed by a lot of the dominant feminist responses, which were liberal, lackluster, and problematic in a lot of ways. So on one hand, those I found disappointing. On the other hand, in different anti-fascist spaces that I were in where that were less liberal, I was often disappointed or frustrated with different elements I saw sort of reproducing different sort of sexist ideas or dynamics. I think I decided to sit down and write the piece first. I was at an event that had a speaker from Europe. He was talking about different anti-fascist struggles in Europe, and his experience happened to be in Germany and Russia. So he was talking about anti-fascist organizing in Germany and Russia, sort of comparing the two, talking about some of the more problematic gender dynamics that were more sort of obvious in Russian anti-fascism. But one of the key points that he made was there was also different problematic elements in German anti-fascism. But what a lot of German, primarily cis men anti-fascists would do would be like, we're not 
we're not sexist, we're not problematic, would just use like, you know, it's like Russian and anti-fascists that are the ones that are like really problematic or sexist. And so this person was giving this workshop and at the same time, a man walked in a bit late to the event, a white anti-fascist man, and he sat down and one of the immediate things he said was, well, we don't have a problem with sexism and anti-fascism like they do in Europe or anything like that. So that moment was obviously frustrating and kind of got me further thinking about um, these ideas that I was already thinking of and wanted to understand further the connections between the rising right and patriarchy. I wanted a feminist perspective that had a more revolutionary analysis. And I wanted to explore what a different anti-fascist politics could look like against what I was seeing. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction and breakdown. We also have with us here today, Elle Jones. So thank you for joining us as well. If you would share a little bit about yourself and your own involvement with this, which you know, we mentioned it was a zine in the first incarnation, and now it's a book on Curse Blubadeb. And since your contribution came closer to the date of publication, there were some events that you were thinking through that had, you know, just recently occurred. Some of them, obviously, after Tammy had written the original zine. So maybe if you would introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your own involvement and contextualize some of the things that were going on as you were and you were grappling as you wrote the introduction. So hi, I'm Al Jones, and I live here in Nova Scotia, the homelands of the African Nova Scotian nation and territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'm an anti-prison organizer, a poet, journalist, and writer, as well as an educator. I came on very, very late in the process, so I've always been a big fan of the books from this press, particularly Butch Lee's work. And in fact, as I say in the sort of end of my introduction, that. One of my poems that I wrote, Harriet Tubman, was based upon Underground to Freedom, which is a really great Butch Lee book on the rebiography of Harriet Tubman. So when Chris asked me to be part of this book, I was like, yes, I'd absolutely love to. But then I actually kind of forgot about it. So I was very, I remember being like right at the deadline. And he was kind of like, it's today or nothing. So I really was writing quite late in the process and responding to what had come before. So responding to Tammy's piece and then also Butch's piece as well. So particularly when I was writing, was sort of in this post-convoy period in Canada, which was represented as, you know, this freedom movement. And of course, as many of us critiqued very early in the pandemic, of course, many of us had critiqued the kind of policing that was taking place. And there was a really great project, Policing the Pandemic, that literally just took reports of how policing was happening and really showed that overwhelming the policing was happening to Black and Indigenous people. So whether that was like harassing unhoused people people who were using drugs, black kids playing basketball, like black people walking on the street. We had a lot of behavior of particularly white women, you know, that would like be confronting a black youth that was just playing basketball outside and, you know, screaming at them. And particularly in my region. So in PEI, there was a an international student from the Congo who was actually sent to jail for violating COVID when he had a mental health issue and he had violated quarantine, but he was in a mental health crisis and they ended up literally jailing him. And then there was a black doctor in New Brunswick, also Congolese. So this also really intersected with people from the continent and people who were immigrants, who was accused out loud by the premier of the province who named him and accused him of actually being like patient zero for COVID in New Brunswick. And it turned out not to be true. So then, of course, when this freedom, and I'm putting that in quotes, movement started about masking and vaccines, I think it was very clear to a lot of us that early in the pandemic, when we were the targets, the people that actually went to jail, the people that got chased out of their province and named by the premier, my province, the premier said people from North Preston, which is a historic black community, were being irresponsible and selfish and partying and was spreading COVID. And in fact, COVID had spread into North Preston because a lot of the women work in the care homes. And of course, those are temporary positions where you're moving home to home to home and care place to care place. And so women got infected in these low wage care jobs, taking care of elderly people in these completely defunded um, long-term care homes that then, of course, largely infected like the Black women on the front line. So it wasn't that people were partying. So all across the region, you had these examples of Black people being singled out, blamed for the pandemic and policed early on, and no one saying a word, and in fact, getting very angry if you critique that policing. And then when white people couldn't go to like a Boston pizza, suddenly it was this freedom and our constitutional rights, and let's hold a convoy. 
So I was really observing on that, as many of us were, the ways that the right wing particularly has used this discourse of freedom and the Charter of Rights, but doesn't care about things like solitary confinement or, you know, women giving birth in prisons or over incarceration or the lack of health care in prisons or habeas corpus by prisoners like facing the conditions or the rights of refugees or the fact that we closed the border against international treaty, like any of those things that happen don't matter to them. And then, of course, when white freedom, as they imagine it, is threatened, individual freedom that has nothing to do with, of course, collective well-being, there's a pushback. So I was really writing out of that space in particular. Um, so how freedom has been so thoroughly co-opted by the right wing as this individualistic project that's, of course, very destructive to the rest of us, a sort of centering of their imagination of themselves as this hero of like this action movie and the the real destruction that's coming from that discourse, while, of course, they remain hostile to any rights discourse by trans people, queer people, black people, indigenous people, yet, of course, claim for themselves the right to disrupt, um, like a city like Ottawa, which they, of course, engaged in, you know, a three week occupation or it was weeks long occupation right in the center of downtown and many accounts of harassment. So I was really writing from that and then also, of course, responding to Tammy's thoughts. So I was lucky in that I had a number of pieces, including Butch Lee's piece and Tammy's piece to respond to and really shape my thinking through. So I was also kind of uh, responding in that space as well. So that was really nice. I think I was the luckiest because I I just got to kind of engage with what was already given to me. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So can you both say a bit about how the whole book is put together? Um, it's really a series of discussions that we hope are still ongoing. And it obviously includes writings from each of you, but also the late, great, much fleet and Veronica L., Say a bit about this moving from a, from a zine to a book and how the conversation kind of built over time and maybe a bit about what's it like to see it all reflected in this final book form. So sure, I can maybe start since I was around for the process from the beginning. It's actually quite a long process, surprisingly. So before it was a zine, it started off as a proposal for a journal article that I was going to write for another political journal. And I had sort of written an outline for that. And as part of gaining, sort of trying to put my thoughts together and engage people in conversation, um, myself and another, a friend of mine who is a great organizer, um, an indigenous woman, we put on a workshop together discussing sort of ideas around anti-fascism and white supremacy, colonialism, and all of that. And had, it was a good workshop, lots of discussion, and that sort of helped shape my ideas in a very useful way. And then around the same time, I ended up on house arrest for some political related charges. And I found myself all of a sudden with a lot of time on my hands. So it seemed like a good opportunity to use that to further work out some of my thoughts. And then that ultimately became a Z that was first distributed um, the Montreal Anarchist Book Fair and sort of grew... From there, Veronica had appreciated the text and shared it around and eventually shared it with Butch Lee, which I was excited about, but also felt a little nervous as someone who I had a huge amount of respect and a little bit of fan appreciation for or, or something like that. Um, so that started a conversation with the text and then, well, I mean, I think I was also incredibly, incredibly lucky in that process in talking about that text. Veronica and Butch had engaged, would have like semi-regular phone chats where they just sort of talk about, you know, politics, things happening in the world, uh, feminism, race, and everything. And I got invited to start participating in those, I think they were monthly at the time or bi-weekly phone conversations, which were such a privilege. So myself and Veronica and Butch and Butch would often ask us uh, different questions sort of about things we were involved in or stuff we saw happening. And she would share her perspective or questions on things happening as well as different aspects of her experience from the past. And it was a very unique opportunity. I think people talk a lot about, you know, intergenerational struggle or intergenerational conversations that this was one of my first experiences of feeling that I was really part of one of those. Um, and that sort of led to the publishing of the follow-up to articles. And then 
afterwards and after Butch's sad death, conversation started about wanting to put together some sort of book project to try to incorporate some of those discussions that were going on in a place to sort of allow to further circulate one of Butch's last pieces of writing. So that's how we got to where we are. Yeah, and for me, like I said, I was brought in quite late, I think, particularly because of a lot of what was being written about in terms of how the history of anti-fascist resistance often, of course, focuses on like white men and ignores these other movements. So thinking more broadly about what that resistance has looked like, and of course, women's contributions and the contributions particularly of women of color, indigenous women, black women, immigrant women have really been erased. So I think there was a feeling that that voice would be a welcome addition. So I think that's where I came in as well. So in the sort of first part of the piece, I'm also trying to think through some alternate formations of resistance. So my mother, for example, that would certainly not frame herself as, you know, an anti-fascist resistor, but comes from an anti-colonial tradition in Trinidad. And so what some of those legacies meant in the ways that women were resisting and not always out in the streets resisting in one model, but resisting in in other ways, like how they resisted inside their homes, how they resisted spiritually, how they raised their children in forms of resistance. So I was really thinking through that as well. So I think that it was just to also add in that voice and then respond in that way. And of course, that's been so much of, of um, Butch's work as well, which has been really contending with white feminism, as we sometimes put it, but I think perhaps more accurately, just liberal feminism, Western liberal feminism. And she's done, of course, so much work on that, like night vision, uh, the military strategies of women and children. You know, there's been so much work. I mean, that is really the body of her work is really trying to dismantle this very liberal model of girl boss feminism and really think about true resistance through anti-colonial methods, through anti-capitalist methods, anarchist methods. So having been again, like I think, you know, it's like with Tammy, like you've just been so influenced by Bush. Like I just, you know, was so influenced by reading her books that the opportunity to be in any sense in dialogue with her was just much appreciated. So I was like, yep, I'm in. Uh, whatever you need me to do, I want to be part of this publication with Butch Lee, who was, of course, you know, bell hooks, really admired her work, had some critiques, but certainly admired her work. Um, I think it's just one of those authors that has been so underground influential in ways that while people may not include her in the immediate canon, if you say, oh, feminist writers, she gets erased in a lot of ways. But I think is so influential in shaping the thought of so much radical feminist thought and particularly like anti-capitalist, anti-system feminist thought as well. So I just wanted to come in and really shove my oar in to be part of it. So that was why I was, I was uh, invited. Which I will say is a really appreciated and nice contribution to further expand the conversation that was already happening that was limiting in, in so many ways. And I think with Butch too, it's so inspiring that you know a revolutionary feminist but sincerely for her entire life and continued to want to interrogate those questions and continue to want to develop thought around that and i think that is just a very unique and inspiring thing to see and try to look into yeah i definitely uh, just want to say a couple of things on that before we move on to i mean um i really appreciate which is response in this book. For one, you get a little bit of biographical information, which is often not the case in uh, a lot of her other writing. But also, we did a study group on night vision with a bunch of folks from, you know, who listen to the podcast and support and things like that. And um, about a year ago, and it was great, you know, it was just a great experience to sit and read that text with folks and think about it collectively. So yeah, anybody who is not familiar with Butch Lee's writing, definitely you need to read it. Oh my gosh, so, I want to just say more yeah. on that. Like it's just so many of the things that people are talking about now. She was really prescient on that. You know, she's writing in like the 90s, late 80s, up to early 2000s is really where we get this bulk of these books. And so much of the stuff we're now addressing, like she's talking about it. She has a whole book on just like white feminism which is is really looking at how, yeah, like girl boss sort of Hillary Clinton feminist. Like, I mean, it's just you have to read her work. Um, I think it's so left out of, of what people think is necessary reading, but she was 
years ahead of her time in her thinking. A lot of her thinking is stuff that people are coming to now and, you know, thinking they arrived at. And Butch was there like 30 years ago. So I just want to really co-sign the Reed Butch Lee. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of it's left out because, you know, it's like it's militant writing. It's writing from the perspective of, you know, people who are in cadre organizations or who are struggling, right, who are trying to really grapple with these questions in terms of thinking about you know, anti-capitalist movements, movements against neocolonialism, you know, feminist movements that, you know, are not, you know, liberal ones, things like that. And, um, you know, that's not what's like favored in the academy. They're not published on um, an academic um, imprint or something like that, you know. And so I think there are reasons why it's left out, but the reasons why it's left out are probably more reason for us to read it, right? <laughs> um so yeah, absolutely. Thank you, both of you, for that. So one of the important interventions of this book, of many, is really looking at the relationship of various forms of patriarchal politics to fascist and right-wing groups. Tammy, you highlight, um, which I really appreciate it because it kind of breaks down different trends or different sorts of right-wing fascism, or um, I think you use the term fascist sexisms that they take on. But you also demonstrate that even though there are these distinctions and differences, that there are these areas of of large agreement. I feel like, unfortunately, we've really seen the fruits of that agreement in recent years in the U.S. with both the criminalization of abortion, but also significant increase in anti-trans organizing, which has taken many forms from, you know, legislative attacks to like you know, fascists taking direct action against direct, you know, making direct assaults on things like drag balls and stuff like that. So can you say a bit about maybe some of the tensions within these uh, fascist sexism and talk about some of the areas where these groups coalesce and find agreement? Yeah, for sure. So I think in wanting to further try to understand the role of patriarchy played in sort of rising far-right politics, spent a lot of time trying to dig in how different groups understood gender, how different groups understood women, what that meant to be a woman, what their role was. Um, and in looking through things, I found that while obviously all fascist politics are patriarchal, there are areas of tension. So on one hand, you have groups and organizations of fascists who, you know, think women are inferior, women are different, but they have a role to play in furthering white supremacy. They have a role to play in furthering the white nation. They might have a role to play even in, you know, movement organizations or white supremacist activism. You know, they may not be on par with men, but they have a place and they can be useful for different aspects of their struggle. So that's sort of one camp and on which sort of talked about in terms of patriarchal fascism. And then on the other hand, what I came to think of in my head as more misogynistic fascism are those groups, individuals, ideas that straight up hate women. I, these are generally a little more contemporary, especially groups that are really influenced sort of by the rise of the alt-right. And for these groups of fascists, there's really no crucial role that women play. Rem women are not only lesser, but are despicable in many ways. You maybe need them for reproduction, but otherwise they're sort of useless. You want them to be managed. They have no space to play in the sort of struggle for white supremacy and the different organizing that people are doing, there is no space for them. And this is sometimes in the past and contemporarily led to sort of mini squabbles between different far right groups who, you know, have women included and see a role from them versus those who don't allow any woman, any women to be included. So those are where the differences come in. But I think at the same time, acknowledging those differences, I found that there are some very clear and straightforward places 
where all far right fascist groups more or less agree which is the idea of gender essentialism, gender difference, and gender hierarchy. So gender essentialism, you know, gender, like their understanding of race, it is biologically determined, it is fixed, and it influences everything about a person, their abilities, even their worth as a human being. It is a universal category. There's no questioning that. And related to their understanding of an essential gender is their idea of gender difference. So this is a very rigid gender binary in which there are two different genders that exist. Those come with very prescribed roles and also very prescribed capabilities based on where you fall in the gender binary. Um, I think their huge sort of emphasis on gender difference and their commitment to the gender binary can come to relate to a lot of the far right attack on queer folks and trans individuals and their roles currently and some of the contemporary trends that you mentioned of sort of different anti-trans legislation and things like that. And then the last piece being a gender hierarchy. So it's not only that gender is essential and that there are differences, there is a clear hierarchy in which men are above women. They are superior in many ways. Yeah, and this is also interesting because uh, for many years, I was actually following this, uh, you know, transphobic discourse, particularly in the UK. So I sort of in real time saw the slide of many people from purportedly left. So people would start with the position like I'm a woman on the left, but I just don't think, you know, prisons or sports or um, and then you actually saw in action how starting at that point where people were you know proudly lefty but had some questions and over the years that i i read these message boards of these places you know then they started adding in crt and identity politics and now many of them are constantly posting you know ben shapiro or matt walsh or you know jordan peterson and i actually think people and so you just see like oh now people are telling lies about them tell me what's racist about you know so like you saw this mass shift uh, through this transphobic discourse into these other issues on the right and anti-wokeism is just like, you know, this broad ideology around what used to be, you know, political correctness. So, you know, queer education, like trans people, sex ed in schools, black people learning about black history, anybody talking about their identity or talking about oppression in particular ways, right? So that kind of alignment that we've also seen between um, you know, the right wing and then purportedly feminist woman. Um, and we've seen, for example, the right wing have great success with this, like, what is a woman type discourse? Um, I actually do talk about it in my chapter as well. And it was an ad that was hailed by many of the white women who watched it as this like wonderful ad. So this watch company does this what is a woman ad, um, which is, of course, deeply transphobic, like woman. But if you look at the imagery, it's white woman caregiving, it's all domestic type stuff. So they show women in sports. It's all like women from the 1960s gymnastics. Like you won't show like Simone Biles or Serena Williams. It's like Soviet gymnasts. So when sports still embodied a particular kind of femininity and of course like European women in sports, not black women in sports, uh, virtually everybody you see in the ad is white. And they use words like, you know, woman's sacred like heritage and the sacred essence of woman, which is of course very much about this like biological nurturing, like giving birth and taking care of elders. When, of course, much of the work of elder care is actually done by like migrant women, you know. So you see that kind of. So, yeah, this, this sort of mashup between like allegedly pro woman discourse and then transphobia, which has really come together and like aligned the right wing with certain segments of the so-called feminist movement as well has been alarming to watch. And then in terms of, yeah, like the relationship to abortion. So really using this kind of discourse of woman's essence of biological essentialism, but also like the idea that people don't really have autonomy. So, for example, in the UK, where you had a lawyer that defended uh, Kira Bell, who went to who said that, you know, I was transitioned again, like I wasn't given enough information. And the lawyer that goes to defend like to be her lawyer in that case is also an anti-abortion lawyer who quite explicitly wants to get rid of Gillick competency, which is in the UK, the decision that says that, yes, you know, adolescents can make decisions about abortion, like a 14 year old can consent to their own abortion. So that very clearly the right wing wants to attack the notion that minors 
can consent to abortion and they're doing it through an attack on trans health care. Because if you say, well, trans kids can't consent to health care, that, you know, 16 is too young or 14 is too young or 18 and 17 is too young. And some people are saying up to 25 is too young. Right. Then that also, of course, flows that then how do you consent to other forms of health care and primarily abortion? Right. So you see this blending of this kind of discourse around consent, but only consent when it's the idea that you can't consent to autonomy or bodily autonomy or make decisions about your medical care. But of course, we don't care about like sexual consent where there's still, you know, you can still like marry off a minor with parental permission in all these states. So a very careful weaponizing of a particular form of women's rights um, by the same people who will, of course, make a what is a woman documentary and then turn around and say that following women's sports in the World Cup is woke, right? So it's like a completely, you know, thin and, and clearly hypocritical stance, but it's been compelling for a lot of people. And when you're reading this material, there is this stance of like reasonableness that can become compelling, right? That all we're saying is that we're against mutilating children or all we're saying is that men should, you know, so there's this discourse that on its surface presents itself as like, isn't that reasonable? So yeah, it becomes a quite difficult discourse in many ways for people to combat because it presents itself as just asking questions or just being reasonable or, you know, just being the adult in the room. And then of course, phrases all activism as childish, extreme, tantrum throwing, deranged, woke, you know, so you get all this kind of, of discourse. And once, of course, you've been labeled as women ought to well know who have been labeled, you know, hysterical. And I mean, obviously, the suffragette movement was labeled as this kind of hysteria and unreasonableness. And of course, once you're being labeled unreasonable, it's a very difficult discourse to speak yourself out of because you're de facto unreasonable. So, you know, and black people have faced this forever, too. Once you determine that, like, you have lower intellect or you're not reasoned or you're not civil or whatever discourse is put upon you, it's very difficult then to argue from that position because anything you say is therefore labeled as a further symptom of your unreasonableness. So, um, yeah, I think seeing that on the rise has been extremely alarming because I think it is very, very compelling to a broad swath of people. And then, of course, we know is is this wedge towards also, as we've very much seen, like in Florida, the pairing of so-called CRT, like critical race theory, with also anti-trans or anti-LGBTQ rhetoric as well, right? So we need to remove books on Black history and we need to remove books that so-called sexualize children. So this becomes part of this rhetoric, um, obviously anti-immigration rhetoric, Islamophobia. So they'll conveniently use spots. So when convenient, it's Black people are actually socially conservative on this or Muslims actually don't support gay people. You know, So you'll get this kind of discourse, but then of course the package deal is anti-immigrant, Islamophobia, Christian nationalist stuff that harms us all, but uses this kind of discourse to, to lure people in. So, and I, I, yeah, I mean, I think you see that very much addressed throughout the text that everybody really trying to grapple with this positioning and how this kind of form of patriarchy and this form of, of right-wing organizing has taken place and is, is in many ways, I think, very, very difficult to combat. I think that's a really important point and really useful to look at sort of how these things have been and like affecting the left or appealing to some people also the ways different otherwise liberatory discourse is co-opted for different ends you think you made a really good point you mentioned the example of sort of people saying well muslims don't support lgbtq rights or something like that and i think there's been lots of examples most of the ones that i'm familiar with in europe but i'm sure you can find them here of um white supremacist groups who are you know 364 days of the year probably super queer and transphobic but trying to you co-opt language around supporting queer rights to get people as a wedge issue to get people to support their larger white supremacist agenda so you know probably don't care at all if anything are like anti-queer folks but will organize events or rallies that are to you know for the safety of queer folks because of muslim immigrants or because of people putting that at risk and i think it's a really dangerous thing when you see things used in that way and something that's very useful to be mindful of i think in relation to abortion i think it's important to acknowledge that there's nothing 
new. There, the, it might like some of the specifics of what the connections between white supremacist organizations and anti-choice movements look like might be different, but that there is a very long legacy of close connections between anti-abortion movements and the far right and the anti-choice movement. I think you can look back in the like starting most recently see like in going back to the 80s there was like a trend of um, different kkk chapters in america were circulating wanted posters that would feature photos and personal information of abortion providers that they would put up and obviously part of the connection of white supremacy is abortion comes to sort of one of the most famous the 14 words slogan that the importance of protecting the white race. I think it's often, you know, what is it? We must secure the existence of our people and the future for our white children. So in the context here, obviously, it's anti-choice. Generally, many people are talking in the context of for white women. And here, I think there'd be some disagreement within the right around choice or abortion for women of color with some having nothing to say on the subject, some thinking, you know, white women shouldn't be able to access abortion, but women of color should be forcefully put into abortion or being very pro-sterilization of non-white women. But the idea of protecting those that are reproducing the white race. And early in the beginning of early 20th century America, the very beginning, things around birth control uh, or abortion weren't very regulated or was only sort of done that sporadically. But with the incoming of different immigrants, that's when you had different white supremacist groups in the early 20th century worried about white the white birth rate and worried about what they refer to as race suicide or the idea that the white race was under threat of being replaced by some other. They think today, let's talk about race suicide, but instead talk about the great replacement. So the idea that white Americans are being replaced by people of color who are, you know, um, unpredictable and immoral and, you know, will produce faster than white people. And that's going to create this like huge disaster where white people are outnumbered. So there needs to be a really clear intervention to make sure that white women continue to fill their primary role of just reproducing the next generation of the white race. Absolutely. Kind of shifting gears here. Um, well, actually, not really shifting gears. You're kind of seamlessly entering this other part of the discussion. So we would just really love for you to discuss the many ways white women's rights are mobilized to enshrine the goals and demands of empire, ultimately so. In the section, White Supremacy, Complicity, and the Legacy of Saver Politics, you make note of the ways anti-immigrant sentiments are justified through the paradigm of that migrant or otherwise racialized men pose an existential threat to women. This, of course, can be tracked historically speaking. We know the earliest feminist movements on behalf of white women were inseparable from and crucial to colonial civilizing missions and were deeply racist, specifically anti-Black and anti-Indigenous, as this logic also birthed the myth of the Black rapist and serves as a means of justifying further Black subjugation via the Jim Crow apartheid. So what are some other examples you have seen of this historically and contemporarily speaking, and, and how and if? We can disentangle the struggle for feminism and, and women's liberation more broadly from the clutches of the most dominant iteration, which is, as we're speaking about, white liberal feminism that is very, obviously, incredibly cozy with empire and, and, and imperialism. Yeah, and I mean, this has been obviously a side of much particularly contemporary critique by black women, like whether this is like the phenomenon of the Karen, particularly white women's co-roles in what often people call soft colonialism. I don't know how soft it was. So um, there's actually a very great essay by a woman named Val Johnson, white woman that I used to work with about um, women that taught in residential schools, in this case, Inuit schools, and would frame themselves as like, we love the children. So they would beat the children, but talk about how much they loved the children while they separated children from their families, while they often played favorites between which children might look whiter and more acceptable. And of course, while they engaged in all these forms of violence, but imagine themselves as as like affectionate, beloved and loving. So, you know, white women played those roles as teachers, largely across the colonies, um, as missionaries. And then, of course, there was often a very role where a woman who were non-conforming within England in particular, I can speak to, that could go out and, and 
find themselves in particular ways in the colonies. So like Mary Kingsley, I remember actually for some reason reading her biography when I was very, very young. And she went to, I believe, like through Uganda, um, so up the river and was you know commissioned to get like scientific samples. And of course, this deeply anti-Black, like anti-African text around like the savage Congo people, you know, but it's hailed in England as this because in in the context of she could both be a feminist figure of, uh, you know, woman going out and adventuring and that non-conforming to femininity therefore becomes part of an English imperial project because, you know, the figure of the woman going out has a particularly look how advanced our nation is like women can go out. So much as we talk about homo nationalism, right, which is where or pinkwashing, which is where countries use the notion of being advanced on LGBTQ rights to position themselves against other countries. So Canada is free. You can have gay marriage here. It's not like Saudi Arabia where they can't, right? So um, when a country or state conveniently uses this narrative of being so-called progressive on gay rights, at the same time as we've just talked about is this broad-based attacks on like trans healthcare, trans kids in particular. In the same way, you often have had that form of feminism during the imperial period where women are on the one hand being like trafficked within the colonies, but also um, women could go find this African queen is another good movie example of that, right? Like where you have this particular like strong figure of the European woman that essentially goes and works herself out upon the colonies. So in a contemporary space, we talk about this a lot through the concept of carceral care. Um, so many of us are speaking a lot about how when we think about policing, we often, of course, think about boys in blue and policing figured as male, figured as street policing and largely directed against men. Um, but there's other forms of policing and those more intimate forms of policing, such as child welfare and often within the healthcare system, are often directed at women. So many people who work as nurses are very um, complicit in calling security on uh, people who are drug users or people in mental health crisis or people who are unhoused, calling the police on people, particularly the collusions between social workers, child welfare, nursing staff. So, you know, like stripping children from their mothers in Canada. This has recently just been so-called banned, but like the birth alert system, which was literally a woman would be identified, a mother would be identified and they'd say, oh, you know, like usually uh, somebody who had been in the care system already or had a history of incarceration. And basically this person is going to be able to parent their child. So the social worker would literally show up at the birth and remove the child before the parent even has a chance to, you know, attempt to be a parent. So largely, of course, those professions are filled with middle class white women. So really continuing on this colonial project that was done through schools and churches before is now often through healthcare systems, through social work. You know, a social worker, once you're on their radar, they can come into your home. They can, without a warrant, they don't need a warrant like the police do. They can make unannounced visits. They observe you parenting. You have to report everything to them. Like, what finances are you? Are you in a relationship? Um, they can tell you that you can't be in a relationship, that they don't want you um, to, to have any form of intimacy. They look through your fridge. They can examine anything, your laundry, whatever. Um, so it's a very, very deep form of policing, largely directed at like people who are gendered as female, at mothers, and it's largely undertaken on the part of the state by white women in these professions as well, which is, of course, upheld by universities, um, the training that takes place in this so-called you know, professional academic environments, which are where people are trained. So you really see this relationship between these professions, between the university and between a particular form of white feminism that still exists, which is part of white saviorism, the idea of like white women on behalf of a kind of paternal culture. And then, of course, often white women weaponizing those things against women of color. Um, so the labeling of black women is angry and threatening. We've see seen so many cases, of course, um, which has particularly come into the contemporary frame of white women using, you know, like their so-called fears or tears or calling the police and being able to weaponize like I'm vulnerable, I'm a white woman, I'm feminine. You know, I'm being attacked, particularly against black men, but also often against black women as well. Um, so, you know, we see those kind of forms, but then also more deeply, you know, like, I mean, like you were in a Barbie moment and I, I saw Barbie. It's not that I disliked Barbie, but um, we can still critique that, you know, this is what our feminist discourse is taken up with right now, as opposed to, you know, the radical form. I, I don't know if there's a coincidence, for example, that Barbie has come out at the time where we're now really suppressing discourse on defunding and abolition, which, you know, after 2020, where there was a whole rise in discourse, which is, of course, largely from Black women and also Indigenous feminists around things like land defense, 
Um, so we have like indigenous women on the front lines. I just came from Winnipeg where um, there's the huge movement around searching the landfill where a serial killer um, murdered multiple indigenous women and they won't retrieve their bodies. So he said that at least one of the women who the police hadn't known about, he had dumped in a landfill. And then there's all these victims and they haven't searched the landfills to know if there's other victims to allow the people that, um, you know, their mother might be resting that landfill to try and get a chance to return the bodies. And they've essentially said it's too expensive and it may be a health danger. So literally saying indigenous women are trash. And of course, there's a huge movement um, of indigenous people, but of course, largely led by indigenous women on those front lines to talk about violence against women and connecting that to broader state violences. So at the same time as this search the landfill movement is going on in Winnipeg, the World Police and Fire Games are in Winnipeg and the government spent millions and millions of dollars and of course all kinds of contributions to bring 8,500 cops, border guards, prison guards and their families into Winnipeg to have like recess. And so people are drawing those connections and largely like indigenous feminists that are also doing our land defense and water defense are getting arrested in Wet'suwet'en. You know, across this country, we're seeing indigenous women stand in front of pipelines and stand at the water and being arrested and criminalized. You know, we've seen black women that are really leading in terms of talking about uh, abolition and, and new ways of approaching harm and, and building transformative justice. And I don't know that it's a coincidence that we are damping that down and being like girl boss feminism again. Well, men can be whatever they want, like be a Barbie doll. And again, I'm not saying we can't have fun. I'm not trying to be the fun killer feminist. It's like, oh, you can't go and watch Barbie. But I'm just saying we can pay attention to the ways that that discourse becomes overwhelming in particular ways and becomes like, oh, this is feminism. Oh, thank God. This seems even reasonable. Men can be involved. It's fun. As opposed to a lot of the feminist work that's taking place on the front lines by indigenous and black women who are never really allowed to claim our own feminism. Um, we're never allowed to center ourselves in feminism. Feminism is always the thing that's happening apart from us. It isn't really us. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's helpful. Tammy, I don't know if you want to jump in. No, I think that was an excellent answer. And as so many starting off points, I think, too, uh, on Winnipeg, I was also just recently... Uh, reading this article that is looking at sort of anti quote unquote anti hate investigations looking at uh anti hate towards police in Winnipeg and making investigations because there are small parts of like anti anti police graffiti in Winnipeg or red handprints and you see police spending a lot of time investigating that and that is just all around horrifying and gross but i think that it, yeah, you know, talking about the Barbie moment, I I think fun is important for sure. But I also I have to admit when things like this happen, I sort of cringe. And I think just how much so much of contemporary feminism can be overpowered by that girl boss feminism, by those Barbie discussions and can sort of overwhelm everything. And, you know, Sure, it's fine if you want to go see that movie. That's not the problem, but it is the problem if these things are your definition of feminism. It is the problem, you know, when someone's like, oh, Barbie's a revolutionary movement, a revolutionary movie, or something like that, um, which obviously it is not and is incredibly, you know, limiting in what it presents. It's very comfortable. It's a very easy vision of feminism that can very much incorporate with how most things are currently organized, where if you were to bring in critiques, like you mentioned, uh, from Indigenous women or Black women, that would necessarily necessitate a larger, at least a larger conversation about very fundamental changes to the world that we live in. And I think, you know, answering the second part of the question of how you move away from that liberal feminism, um, I think part of it is you know looking at the people who are doing actually on the ground organizing who are actively engaged in struggle pop culture is a thing it's very influential um but you know at best i think that can be a stepping stone for people to consider things happening in the world but it's what people are actually doing where struggles are actually happening that is important and being wary of how feminism, like so many things, can be so easily co-opted 
four ends that I would say are far, far from liberatory. Thank you both. That's great. So L, one of the things that Butch Lee talked about in her piece is neocolonialism, which of course she was, you know, famous for writing about. I'm thinking about night vision in particular, but also a lot of her work. You write in the introduction about how much her work meant to you and how it equipped you to deal with the gaslighting of Hillary Clinton, or I think it's Anita Anand, who is an Indian woman who was also the Minister of National Defense for Canada just recently, who you describe as presiding over sexual assaults and neo-Nazis within the military. And you also talk in your piece there about various attempts at co-optation of the movement for Black Lives and against police terror over the last few years, and how these things are happening right alongside, of course, a a white left that, especially, you know, in recent years on some of these issues has found some alignment with, you know, the right wing, essentially. What are some of your thoughts on these issues today, either just sharing some of your reflections from the introduction along these points or what you're thinking about today with regard to these various threats to liberatory movements, movements of black and brown folks against state violence and radical feminist movements. I think being black in Canada is interesting because on one hand, we are, you know, part of the colonial world, the first world. We were very active. Like we took a leadership role in the coup in Haiti against our state. You know, we're a big part of the Lima group. Um, AFRICOM, you know, so we play our role as well in contemporary neo-colonialism as well. But because we're a step removed from the U.S., I think being Black in Canada, you also kind of have that vision of looking at the U.S. and how U.S. imperialism also encompassed. I mean, we had a Black president of the U.S. who drone bombed teenagers, right? So anybody who really thought that, um, oh, you know, we'll just have a Black president and that somehow signals something. I hope everybody was disabused in that by Obama's presidency. And so being Black and Canada, you can both, of course, you see yourself as in the shadow of the great beast, the U.S., but also, of course, we participate in ways that we don't always want to be honest about. And I say that just to say that, um, like, contemporary Black thought isn't really coming out of North America. Like, this isn't where the most exciting thought is, but we continue to believe it is. And in Canada, of course, nothing can happen in Canada if it hasn't happened in the U.S. first. Like the way that black issues make their way in Canada is something happens in the U.S. and then they go and try and find a Canadian equivalent. So, you know, George Floyd, then there's a movement. Then it's like, oh, I'm in Canada, as if we don't have deaths by police weren't constantly happening as well, as if we didn't have cases, but they only became legible after George Floyd because once it happened in the U.S., then it gave us permission to care or talk about it in Canada. And this is always part of the problem that, you know, the U.S., is always figured as the place where real oppression, real slavery, real segregation, et cetera, took place. The implication being blackness truly belongs to the U.S. and racism truly belongs to the U.S. and isn't really a thing in Canada. So black people are both perceived as newcomers, not really existing in Canada, not really existing in numbers that matter. And therefore, anti-blackness also isn't a real thing in Canada. And we're just projecting, you know, our old police chief, the one before the one we have now in Halifax called it the Ferguson effect, which was literally his belief that we only believe we experience police brutality because we watch this stuff on TV and like we watched Ferguson and now we think we experience these things. So this is a very common discourse in Canada, but in North America in general and more broadly, like the European Western world there's always this belief that like the revolution will come from here. I mean, Marx is writing about this thing. Like, it's not like Marx understood or cared about what was taking place on the continent or through the Caribbean or whatever when he was writing either, right? So part of the problem is that in North America, we believe that we're creating the revolutionary world, ignoring like, you know, what's going on in Haiti um, I mean, right now as we're talking. I mean, look what's happening in Niger and Mali and Guinea and uh, Burkina Faso, you know, where people are saying, well, we're done with France taking our uh, resources. So Mali is like, we're not going to have French as an official language anymore. Niger has banned exports of uranium to France. And this is part of a broader move where people are saying we are a resource rich continent and Europeans have been extracting and undeveloping us too long. Something that Rod, uh, Walter Rodney talked about, the systemic underdevelopment of Africa. And you have that happening like right now, that discourse and whatever you feel about the politics. And I'm not an expert in Niger, so I'm certainly not positioning myself on speaking about that. It's very clear that um, this 
form of discourse is is growing where people are saying you know, like we don't care what you think france you know um so you know we've had all kinds of movements workers movements in haiti uh you know chile uh, of course venezuela bolivia um like really across latin america uh, across the caribbean as well and across the continent so um i think part of understanding black liberation is we have to be in an internationalist perspective around what's happening across the world so believing that you know black lives matter is the only or summed up or somehow was the carrier of black liberation of course misses all the different movements that have been taking place so i think it, it's very easy to fall in a kind of myopic like north american centered vision where everything black comes out of the us and we can only care and think about things as they're driven by us discourse and politics when in fact much of the extremely radical work and thinking and organizing is not taking place in any of our countries, like in the in North America, is taking place in the Caribbean, in Latin America, and in Africa. So I guess I'd say that first of all, yeah, I, I think that's one thing you haven't seen that the left has really abandoned is a internationalist perspectives in general, and particularly the anti-war piece, right? Um, so of course, um, when we talk about policing, that is deeply tied to the military, the militarization of the police, obviously, um, but also, of course the way what we send our military to act as police in other countries. So, you know, we need to be drawing those connections, defunding the military as well and talking about the role of the military. But the left really doesn't do foreign policy discourse. You don't hear a lot of discourse on Canada's role in Haiti, um, Canada's role in Latin America, Canada's role in Africa. You don't hear about these things. And then, of course, more generally, like, and this is something that the right has kind of taken over, like where, you know, Trump was talking about regime change wars and the right, of course, not in a way that, of course, supports sovereignty of African people or indigenous people across the world. Like They're not against the Canadian mining companies that are going with their private militias and violating the environment. You can't be anti-military and not be anti-corporation or not be pro-environment, right? Like, like the military is the biggest polluter. So they're not interested in the discourse around like preserving indigenous land rights or anything like that. But they take it on in that superficial way, like, why are we doing these regime wars? So actually the right was able to sort of slide in and, and take on a particular kind of anti-war discourse under Trump in particular, because um, the left has really, I think, let that drop in terms of really thinking about um, our role internationally. So I think that is something that particularly as Black people, as African descended people, I mean, how do we talk about reparations without talking about, this is driven by a lot of the Caribbean discourse, um, where Harry Kahn in particular has very, clear um, plans and rhetoric and policies around and challenges around reparations that are guiding a lot of us on how to think about these issues and how to form them. So I think that we need to be taking up very much the anti-war position. Um, we do have things like Black Alliance for Peace, but I think more Black people need to be understanding those connections. And when I say the understanding, I mean, that means we have to do the education, right? Like obviously schools don't teach us this. We're not going to get it from the news. Um, you know, it's not something that anyone is going to give you. So how do we do the kind of education? It's hard enough to understand our domestic issues. You know, it's a lot to try and understand what's happening in Niger, what's happening in Mali, what's happening in Jamaica, what's happening in South Africa. Like, that's a lot. So uh, we need to, I think, be returning to a lot of the strategies that we use, like study groups, um, you know, book clubs, whatever it is, to, to really be talking about these things. Because I think we do have a very myopic view of Black liberation, and that makes it very easy to be folded into these very neoliberal formations. So um, this is something I obviously struggled against and been much critiqued for. Um, so Desmond Cole and I, for example, wrote a series of articles about an initiative called the Black North Initiative, which was basically like, we need more Black people on corporate boards. Um, the person that is the leader of that, Wes Hall, made his living within the mining industry. So we did a series of pieces talking about like how does getting all these harmful corporations that sell weapons and harm the environment and like literally kill black people in other countries through like the mining industry. How does them signing a pledge against racism benefit any of us? And how does getting more black people in the boardroom of a place like Enbridge promote black liberation when these are the biggest corporate polluters, the biggest criminalizers of, of resistance by indigenous and black people across the world? So that is very unpopular discourse. Um, the idea of pushing back that we just need more black cabinet ministers. When we fought the deportation of a young man named Abdul Abdul D, at the time, the minister of immigration and citizenship was actually a Somali man, Ahmed Hussein. And we took a lot of um, blowback for challenging him because he faces racism, which is true. 
but he was also deporting another Somali person. So, you know, having this discourse is challenging um, because people still believe that representation matters and that we've made it in these particular respectable ways when we've made it into the halls of power, we've made it into the Senate, or we've made it into government, the cabinet, or, you know, we have black police chiefs. And so moving away from that rhetoric is extremely challenging because you're seen as attacking black people, as being jealous, as being a hater, as being a malcontent, as being dangerous in these particular ways. And in many ways become out of step with what is framed as the voice of the community, particularly the elite voices, and they do attack you. And we've had a very difficult time in a lot of ways. We've been smeared. We've been, you know, like had all kinds of stuff said against us. And it can be difficult to fight through that. But I think that's actually important. This is, of course, in line with, to go back to Butch Lee, these are all things she predicted and talked about. She was talking about in the lens of white feminism, but we also see it, of course, in the black elite classes. I know Adolf Reed isn't everybody's cup of tea and people have critiques of him, but Adolf Reed has always been extremely lucid on these kind of matters. That the idea of, you know, the black elite classes that are a construction of the white elite. So the idea of a black community is a construction of whiteness that then allows them to have a captive, collusive group of people to speak to at the so-called table and then claim speaks to the whole community. And this is you know, becomes gatekeeping for black radical action. So I'm actually in many ways, I never want to be negative because I see all kinds of organizing that's taking place. Obviously the organizing that people do inside prisons, I've organized with prisoners in all kinds of ways. I've organized with people facing deportations, people facing homelessness, you know, so there's a lot of radical organizing taking place at these sites, but it can be very difficult, I think, because we are fighting through an elite class that's really interested only in in having, you know, more black faces in high places and not challenging capitalism, not challenging classism in our society, not challenging the fact that, you know, what we got out of 2020 was a few business grants and no liberation for the mass of people. And people are, are interested in often wielding those names when convenient. So I am George Floyd when convenient. But when it actually comes time to advocate for, you know, the actual masses of people that face oppression, those people are embarrassing. Those people are criminal. They make us look bad. Oh, you know, and, and the same kind of narrative is used of respectability, of harm, of criminalization. So, you know, this is, I think, is our task. Like in 1950, we had like, you know, one preacher, one teacher, and we had to put up with whatever they wanted to do. But in 2023, we really have to think about what collective liberation looks like. And I include myself. I'm obviously also somebody in, you know, the educated formerly educated classes, you know, I am an elite in that sense. And we really have to interrogate ourselves on these matters and talk about why our liberation has not extended beyond a few representatives into white institutions and why we have not been able to make any headway in building our own institutions and particularly in working class led movements and why we take part in suppressing those movements so often. Thank you. That's great. So next question, uh, Tammy, can you share a little bit about one of the things you do in your essay is also share examples of anti-fascist resistance. You give one example of, I think just one of, of queer resistance and then basically caveat that that's a, you know, that would be a whole project in itself to kind of look at that because it's extensive as well. But could you share a little bit, one of the things you look at is is the resistance of women in anti-fascist movements and anti-fascist women's activity and organizing. So you talk about the 1935 Italian invasion of Ethiopia and the women who participated in resistance efforts to that, specifically the Ethiopian Women's Volunteer Service Association. Could you discuss a little bit of their tactics in numerous aspects of their struggle, including domestically and militaristically that you speak of in the book? Yeah, for sure. So this was an example before, you know, doing this piece of writing I didn't know about, which is unfortunate and, you know, admittedly probably not surprising as if you, you know, you start any search of like anti-fascism immediately, it'll just take you to any discussion in Europe. But I want it to look beyond that and, you know, found many really inspiring stories coming out of Ethiopia, which basically, you know, after 1935, Mussolini's forces invaded Ethiopia, there is ongoing resistance. And from the very beginning, women played a large role in that. 
one such group was the Ethiopian Women's Volunteer Service Association, which was pre-existing and basically turned itself in to a specific fascist resistance organization. The women who were involved took part in a huge diversity of activities. Some more standard things you'd probably associate with women, you know, supplying fighters with clothing, food, doing different healthcare things, taking care of injured soldiers. They also did things like providing shelter to those who need it, forging documents, producing propaganda, things like that. Some women sort of worked beyond the front doing resistance work in their communities. Some became uh, camp followers who traveled to the front with many of the men who were fighting, doing a lot of sort of the reproductive labor that was necessary for those men. I think some of the interesting stories that I came upon were one of some of the other ways that Ethiopian women engaged in resistance where some of them, it was not uncommon for a strategy to be fraternizing with Italian soldiers to sort of purposely engaging in activities to further their struggles. So when we would take on soldiers, and there's even examples of high-ranking officers as lovers, and they would use these relationships to build a false sense of trust and use these relationships in various ways to further the anti-fascist struggle. So in some cases, these relationships would be used as a way to gather information. So build trust with the Italian soldiers, gather important information, and then pass that along to the anti-fascist struggles. In other cases, it would be used to try to purposely steal resources, weapons, different things from the Italian soldiers. And then in some cases, it would also be a way of sort of misdirection. So these women would sort of play a double role of claiming, you know, they were supportive of the fascist struggle and they would feed false information to the Italian soldiers about things that were upcoming that weren't happening or giving the wrong, wrong location of something happening and something like that. So that was one strategy. Also, well, not the only way that women participated, women also took on more military focused roles. So some women did engage in fighting. There are sort of specific circumstances if there was a wife or a daughter who happened to inherit a family's land and weapons and there wasn't another male family member to inherit, it was expected that they would perform all of the military duties that were previously upheld by the men. So in these examples, women themselves would take on primary leading roles in certain aspects of the military. So basically covered a whole spectrum of being on the front fighting, doing care work and taking care of people in a wide range of ways, um, to being really, really creative and finding ways to use relationships with Italian soldiers to further their aims. Thank you. So yeah, Dan, maybe if you're willing to as well, uh, maybe you can share a little, a little bit of examples of Mujeres Libres, hope I'm not butchering that pronunciation, during the Spanish Civil War, and the Yugoslavian women's involvement in the national liberation struggle against the fascists like during World War II that you provide in the text. Who were they and what drew you to these examples? For sure. So I would say for both Spain and Yugoslavia, I mean, I started looking at a wide range of examples, but wanted to narrow it down for this piece of writing. And I think I'll go into more explaining the specifics of the resistance that happened in these two places, but what really caught my attention in these places was the extent to which anti-fascism, women's liberation were really closely tied to a larger revolutionary vision, were tied to larger revolutionary movements. And that was something that I found very inspiring to look at. So I guess if we're starting with Spain, so in the context, 1936, you have a civil war breaks out in Spain between fascist and Republican forces. Um, and like Ethiopia, from the beginning, there's lots of women involved in the struggle. But women find themselves in a unique position in which they're basically fighting a struggle on several several fronts. So you have the first one of obviously they're engaged in the struggle against fascism. So that is one aspect of their struggle. They're also, for the women who are a part of revolutionary organizations, they were on a struggle with sort of more broader anti-fascist forces. 
to push them towards a more revolutionary politics. So push them, okay, we're fighting against nasty fascism, but what else are our politics? What do we want the world to look like after this finishes? Everything like that. And then finally, within the sort of larger liberation movements, which they were involved in the case, Mujeres Labor, Mujeres Libres, I'm sure I'm butchering too, which were part of the larger anarcho-syndicalist movement, they found themselves having to fight with comrades in that organization to take gender liberation seriously. So for Mujeres Libres, which is free women, so they're free women of Spain, they were an anarchist organization. They were founded a few months before the outbreak of the Civil War. They were, again, an explicitly anarchist organization that were founded to contest women's subordination and Spanish society at large, but also to mobilize the men, help to support them in engaging in politics and engaging in struggle. Um, In terms of the different types of work that they engaged in, one of the things that sort of is a common thread between the different examples that I looked at in different places is women really engaged in all, all different types of work in struggle. There might have been more women involved in one aspect than the other, but they really were involved in a vast diversity of different types of activities. So similarly, you had them fighting as partisans on the front lines, so getting in combat. You also had them doing, again, more traditional women's type labor, engaging in healthcare, aiding the wounded. They formed collective kitchens. They organized to help support refugees and things like that. What made this organization unique and interesting to me was that they had a very specific emphasis on organizational autonomy. So as I mentioned, they were already part. They were militants in a broader anarchist movement, but they found that while that movement, you know, met some of their aims, it was lacking in others. And they saw value in organizing autonomously amongst women to further their politics. So part of this goal, part of this aim, was they understood their role in supporting women. So they saw themselves as helping to do political consciousness raising work, basic work like helping women to overcome illiteracy. They organized different discussion groups to help sort of challenge ignorance, talk about basic healthcare ideas, and really move to try to make women see themselves as not only, you know, capable and equal to men, but also capable of being political subjects, that they could take part and they would benefit from taking part in larger anti-fascist struggles that were taking place. So that's Spain. So moving on to Yugoslavia, when I started doing this research, I was quite familiar with Spain just because of the very specific anarchist connotations, which is a history I'm more familiar with. Yugoslavia, I knew that there was like women involved in anti-fascist struggle there. But when I started to dig, I was actually really surprised at the scope. And the reason I ended up including that example is just that a huge, a massive number of women were involved in the anti-fascist struggle there. I think some reports are like 100,000 women who are like fighting as partisans and over like 2 million women who are involving, who are involved in the anti-fascist struggle in different ways. Hard to know how exactly those numbers are being attributed, but still a massive amount and quite unique. So in that context of a huge amount of women in Yugoslavia participating in anti-fascist struggle, there was sort of different ways in which women came to participate. So more informal ways. So this would be women who weren't part of any political group or organization, but in their daily life, acting autonomously, women would do various things to support the fascist struggle. So they would do important work of like passing information between partisans. They would act as spies. They would work on providing food for those struggling. They would also come in to help harvest crops for neighbors who were at the front or in prison. So doing a lot of the work to sort of keep things going. In addition to sort of the more informal organizing, there is also more explicit formal groups of women who are involved in the anti-fascist struggle in Yugoslavia. So shortly after the German invasion, there was a specific women's organization, the Anti-Fascist Front of Women, that was established, which was sort of an offshoot of a larger 
communist organization at the time. And kind of similar to women in Spain, they saw themselves as playing a twofold struggle. So they were working to fight fascism, but they were also fighting to support the liberation of women. And in this context was understood as part of a larger socialist struggle for revolution. This large organization, they organized committees in towns, villages, and cities across the country. And within this context, women took on, again, a huge diversity of roles, including ones that were more gendered. So things like sewing and laundry, food production, healthcare, but also, again, espionage, sabotage, engaging in front work. They also, they set up and ran hospitals, orphanages, public kitchens, amongst other things. And I think one of the things I found most noteworthy was while they're doing this work, part of their goal was trying to get transform women into seeing themselves, again, as equals, and that would operate in a futurist, so a future socialist state. So that works on you know, developing anti-fascist politics, but obviously part of a much larger revolutionary vision. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, another thing that Tammy lays out in the section um, towards the feminist Antifa is that there is this tendency to, to look at anti-fascist struggle in terms of hierarchical ranking in, in which certain forms of activity, combat fighting, involvement, former political organization, et cetera, are placed at the top in all other forms of activity are seen as secondary or less important, end quote. So for both of you, uh, what can you say about how looking at the history of feminist organizing offers up a more robust and a certain set of options for anti-fascist struggle and might upset the hierarchy in some ways? Has this informed or validated your own practices in certain ways? Yeah, I mean, I always say that, I mean, from the perspective of of a black woman, I guess. And I'm, I I want to say that every time I'm using woman, I'm not using that like exclusively as like cis woman. I just feel like I need to say that. But I always feel that there's a particular, there's a few things that I think train us from birth for organizing. I think um, number one is just the general role of, of women in our community. I'm not going to suggest the black woman, um, that the black community is like a patriarchy free community. It's obviously heavy amounts of patriarchy, um, much of which I contend with, but we do still have, I think, an orientation towards our elder woman as well. There is, I think, still a, a very public and accepted role of like grandmothers in particular. So I think you always have an an example of elder woman organizing and those women, like, you know, they're organizing inside churches. My own mother, that's like a church lady organizer, you know, like they, they're just the kind of organizing that you grow up watching them do that isn't labeled organizing or political work, but is just this daily work of all kinds of service. So like if I take my own mother, who is certainly not like a political organizer, but is the person that, you know, makes sure that the coffee's out after church every service and helps put the flowers up in the church and then goes and visits like all the sick people and all the people that can get communion and like she's going to the homes and, you know, like just does all this kind of, of like service based church work, which is political organizing. Those are the backbones and skills in the way that, you know, people come together to support each other. Like there's just so many examples of really what we would now call mutual care and see that as a particular kind of particularly abolitionist organizing that we just grew up watching our family members do. And so I think it's very easy to translate those skills into all kinds of organizing. But again, often that work has not been labeled organizing. So people see organizing as the person making the speech at the front of the rally, organizing a rally, you know, like the, there's some very overt kinds of, you know, getting in a clash with police. Like those are seen as, as sort of overt forms of organizing. And as like this whole book kind of looks at often are framed as male, masculine and then the province of men. And then all the other forms of organizing, like who made sure there was coffee at the event, who made sure the elders could get a drive there, who brought tobacco if like, you know, there's indigenous elders there. You know, who got on the phone and used their phone list for a lot of calls. And a lot of times it, it's like women that possess us. I'm not doing an essentialist thing here. Like it's the nature of women to be. I'm suggesting that for social reasons, you know, women have been pushed into those roles, have used those roles as a form of power as well. So I think that there's a lot of that kind of activity that we see that is very valuable for learning how to organize. Lynn Jones, who's a elder woman in Nova Scotia, who's just taught me everything I know for the most part about organizing and 
you know, just constantly reminds you about bringing your work back to community and what is community saying about that and not acting on your own on behalf of people, but getting that consensus, no matter how frustrating and difficult it is, like having to go into community and work through people. She's very, very big on that relationship that really pushes you into collective organizing and not thinking that, you know, you always know best or like I'm the organizer, or I'm the person at the front. So I think that's very important. The first piece of organizing I did in Nova Scotia was with uh, Denise Allen, who's also a survivor of Africville, which was a black community that was destroyed by Halifax in the 1960s. The people were relocated. And so it was environmental racism before we really named that and going around in the black community and making people aware of a dump that existed outside a community called Lincolnville, a second generation dump and raising people's awareness of, of how so many black communities were close to like some kind of environmental disaster or garbage dump or the runoff from the steel mill or polluted water, or that kind of thing, and going door to door and knocking doors with her in the community. So when I think back to my own organizing trajectory, both within my own family and then within the African Nova Scotian community, it was really black women showing me how to organize and really getting on the ground. So I think that that kind of, that's a sustainable organizing. We saw this, if 2020 didn't give us a lesson in this, we had this mass movement, but we did a lot of mobilizing. And then there wasn't a lot of long-term organizing that carries you through. And we know from like the civil rights movements that, you know, it was black women that already had auxiliaries and had all these networks set up that were able to then pull on those networks that became civil rights organizing. And we know that those women, women like Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, you know, these are women that taught King how to organize that were already involved in like communist field school organizing and teaching people how to read to get the vote and like organizing schools. And, you know, they were they were organizing long before King. And in fact, they brought in King because they recognized they needed a voice from outside the community and they chose him deliberately. They saw his skills and nurtured him. But we forget about those women. So I think there's already such a legacy of feminist organizing in all these spaces, sustainable organizing that isn't necessarily done for the media or done in public and isn't necessarily even done in the streets, but is taking place in kitchens, like as women are like raising kids, as women are figuring out how to get food on the table, just through women's friendships, which is still a revolutionary act in a society that constantly tells, you know, women that we can't be friends with each other, and we have to be constantly competitive. So learning to build those solidarities. And that all builds us the tools that we need for when we need to show presence and when we need to show up and when we need to draw upon collective power and to understand how to work ourselves within that and solve conflict and try and get consensus from people who disagree and work with people that you don't always like. Like These are all really important skills and these are the skills that we use to build the abolitionist world, right? So when we talk about alternatives to punishment, we have to have stuff that we can build that's opposite to the prison. Like if we don't have an option other than prisons and police, like who do we call if we don't call police? And they often say that, right? Like, oh, well, like what happens when you need to call the police? And it's like, well, because we haven't set up an alternative but we know that women and like trans femmes and, you know, all kinds of people have organized outside of those systems to, you know, do interventions on domestic violence and provide housing for people. And there's all kinds of things that we can do that move us outside of state systems and move us outside of systems of punishment and that do offer us transformation and care and healing. And those things I think have always existed. And I think that, you know, it's talking to our elders, understanding those ways, um, you know, Doing that intergenerational organizing that Tammy started with when talking about Butch Lee and, and working with Butch Lee and, and organizing that way. And I think, again, like the media has a real interest in emphasizing youth organizing and not emphasizing the knowledge and work that our elders have. So I think that the thing that makes organizing sustainable, that makes it adaptable, that makes it able to meet the moment, that makes it able to quickly understand what's happening and strategize to meet that is this constant, constant work on a human level of, of feeding each other, talking to each other, talking about sexual violence with each other, um, hearing our histories, um, doing mutual childcare, making it possible for us to show our presence. All those things are organizing skills and tools. So I'm very grateful that, you know, I was raised in a family that's largely a matriarchy. Like for a long time, we only had one boy a generation. So, you know what I mean? Like I was raised around very powerful organizing women that whether they were organizing in the churches or whatever, like were a model of just how to exert yourself upon the world. And I've always taken that as a model. And I continue to take that as a model for anti-fascist organizing, anti-capitalist organizing, anti-prison organizing, anti-police organizing, and then not just the anti, but the what are we building in its place, those transformative organizings as well. Okay, thank you, Tammy. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? 
a couple of things. First, I'd say, admittedly, my experience is quite different. I'm like a, a white settler, third generation Eastern European, but whatever um, immigrant who's not very close with my family. I had like some women in my family who like, you know, did lots of care work and things like that, but don't come from a very political uh, family. And, um, you know, generally a few generations down with immigrant sort of community bonds often start to disintegrate. So I think as I got politicized throughout my life, I spent a lot of time searching for different legacies to draw inspiration from searching for different histories that I identify with. And I think for me, looking at histories of different things that women, and I think Ella is very good making the point of not thinking that of an essentialist way, but women very broadly defined um, have engaged in resistance has been something that has been really influential in my life of feeling a legacy to want to belong to, to want to deserve to belong to and see some of the amazing things that folks have done at different times in history and try to take inspiration from that in terms of, you know, learning, learning lessons from things that they did, but also slightly less materially, I think, you know, it's very easy to get depressed at the state of the world. It's very easy for things to feel overwhelming and for things to feel impossible. And when I feel that way, you know, looking at all the things that have been done is something that, you know, can reinvigorate me with the idea of, yes, other things are possible. There's so much that is possible. And I think that is really important. So that has been one thing for me. And I think in addition for sort of drawing from those histories, I've also, you know, try to learn and draw experience from daily life and things I see around me. Um, Al, you mentioned sort of the question of like, what happens, you know, if you don't want police, what do you do? <laughs> Which is always such an important question. And I remember a time in my life a few years ago and by someone who is, you know, an anarchist, a feminist, I'm anti-police, I'm anti-prisons, anti-carceral, found myself in a situation with a close friend in a situation of domestic abuse and being like, okay, how, how do I deal with this? I'm not going to call the cops. I don't want to engage that, but I need to address the situation. This is a question of someone's safety. This is, this is important that I Remember at the time, disappointedly, sort of at first, you know, I talked to a couple male friends who were sort of just like, oh, I cliche, but I don't know. It seems like a personal matter. I, I don't want to get involved. And, you know, at the time I, I worked in a workplace that was predominantly like women and queer folks. I was like newer to this workplace, so I didn't know them as well, but sort of talked to these, these folks about the situation and ended up getting, you know, a group of people together that were, you know, all women or genderqueer and trans folks to come over and help, you know, de-escalate a situation and come up with a solution that wasn't policing. And it was, you know, <laughs> messy and complicated, but was a good example of seeing the ways that people can come together, you know, creatively to try to do different things and how important it is to constantly be trying to do those different things. Yeah, I do want to add, because I don't think we should just leave it implicit, that so much of this organizing is being done by queer and trans Black women as well, as well as like trans men and non-binary people as well. But particularly, you know, the organizing of queer women, I think of like Bev Bain in Toronto, who has like just stayed, you know, with her boot on the back of everybody. You know, so there's just some really strong legacies of a particularly queer organizing in Canada that I think are really important. And I just wanted to shout out Bev Bain since I was listing elders that have been really important. Um, sure. And of course, particularly given, I think, again, like this kind of idea that often it defaults to, well, we need a man to be the real leader. So, you know, it's, the woman can mess around, but when it's time for a real leader, where are like the cis hetero men? But it's like so largely like the queer woman that are on the front lines leading this organizing. So we often, again, see those kind of contributions. Race. And that goes back to what I was saying about, like, you know, Butch Lee, why aren't we reading 
her radical text is the content, but also, you know, like a butch woman who like largely disinvested from whiteness and like stood up for black women. Like, are we surprised that, you know, that woman would be, everyone would do everything they could to like, let us not know that that's possible and that people can actually act that way. So yeah, I just wanted to add that in. Yeah, I think that's very important. Yeah, much appreciated. Thank you. So I, speaking of Butch Lee, I love if we could say a little bit more about her response to the piece. You know, obviously you've already talked about how it was kind of an ongoing discussion, right? Like the the written form is part of it, right? There's also many conversations that sound like Tammy, you had with her. So, you know, first of all, just what a gift for both of you to be featured alongside have your work, which is also wonderful, featured alongside one of her last pieces of writing. Basically, for folks who don't know, I mean, you can find her contribution online on Curse Blubbadub's website, and we'll link it in the show notes. But essentially, it was kind of a review, or, you know, that was how it was originally published on their website, at least. But she had very positive things to say about the original zine that you wrote, Tammy. But she did also have her own perspective, right? And so there are some points of, you know, maybe disagreement, but maybe just like trying to reorient or, you know, think about things through her lens, offer up her lens. And one of the things that she noted was that the examples of anti-fascism that you use all kind of fit into these categories of, of women amid wars of resistance to European fascism. Even the example of Ethiopia, obviously, we're talking about the invasion of Italian fascists. And obviously, she's saying that partly because like, she's drawing upon an understanding also of fascism within North America and the US specifically that, you know, like the Black Panther Party and other groups were identifying, you know, that would be a a longer durée and kind of a different idea of what fascism looks like. So I think, you know, part of what she was saying was also that this is a challenge in thinking about like, what are we grappling with in terms of what's upon us now, right? Does that help us to always refer back to this European idea of fascism or is that actually a, a hindrance in some ways? So, you know, I'm just interested in what either of you made of her remarks and did they provoke certain thoughts within you or reflections as you think about the task today? Yeah, for sure. I, I think her observations, I'd say, were absolutely true and an excellent point to bring up. I mean, the examples did, you know, focus on a very specific time in history, a very specific context in a way in the context of war and sort of you know, dynamics of perceived outsider invaders and whatnot, like fascist struggles, I think are much more straightforward and easy in those contexts in a particular way. I mean, you know, bloody and brutal, but a more, more straightforward. And I think, you know, there are huge limitations from what you can learn from those and the extent to which you can apply lessons to struggles, you know, in the U.S and Canada, which are, you know, different histories. And when we're talking about fascism and white supremacy in Canada and America, it's not at a particular moment in time. It is, you know, foundational to the construction and ongoing functioning of, of those societies and what it looks like is going to cover so many, so many different forms. And I think that wasn't the focus of my writing in that zine, but I think you know, looking at histories of anti-fascist struggle in Canada and the U.S., and importantly, not only looking at struggles or events that explicitly identified as anti-fascist, because I think that label can be limited, is important and is incredibly worthwhile. And I think the lessons that you could draw from looking more in the, into the specifics of resistance in these countries would likely be more applicable to the examples that you could draw from, you know, Europe almost 100 years ago. I think for me in looking at those examples, they are interesting stories that felt inspiring to me at a time that things felt frustrating or not a lot 
felt possible or I was feeling frustrated about what felt possible. And I feel like they were useful to me and a reminder of, you know, that people are always struggling, but people are always struggling. And, you know, the history of the continent is people constantly struggling about against white supremacy and colonialism. So I think further looking into that is, you know, very important and incredibly relevant. Awesome. Thank you. So just to kind of follow on that point a little bit is one of the things that I really appreciate about this book is that because it's four of you and there is kind of, you know, ongoing conversation, reflection with each other, and you're all approaching these issues from your own vantage point, various different lenses. And so I think there are like, a, you know, what I like is that it's not it's not a book that has like prescribed <laughs> answers to everything, but has a lot of, you know, kind of thorny and open questions or different visions about several things, right? And some of them might be like, what constitute fascism itself, right? How do we define anti-fascism in relation to that? Even I think, you know, one of the things you talk about, Tammy, is like, you know, is it enough to just sort of be anti-fascist, right? Or do we have to actually have some kind of positive politics or revolutionary politics attached to this? You know, obviously there's there's a grappling with kind of the role of white people in anti-racist struggles. The, you know, what does the struggle look like from here? Whether gender constitutes a class status, which is sort of a question that Butch Lee is kind of, I think, sort of pushing at with her, with her intervention. And there's there's other ones, right? There's ones that I'm not even, you know, thinking of that come up. So, you know, I'm curious for either of you, if if any of these debates or discussions challenged or changed some of the ways you were thinking about or thinking through the process, and if there are things where when you read these read these pieces now with some, you know, removal from their arguments that you would have like gone back to and updated or added to to further explore. And if so, if you'd be willing to share kind of any of those thoughts. For sure. So I feel like Talking about the specific disagreements or the specific areas that it would change my thinking, I feel like it's hard to pinpoint one area. I'm sure, it has like impacted my thinking in in lots of ways. I feel like I think it is important, and I'm committed to always trying to work out these questions of struggle, these questions of resistance, and you know. The question of what the role of like white people's and anti-racist struggle is so complicated and is so huge. And, you know, how do you exactly define fascism or does gender constitute a class? You know, that those are questions that I can't answer. And I don't think I would ever be able to give a definitive answer to. I think, you know, over the years as I've been involved in different things, I've really just come to appreciate sort of the approach of being humble and always being like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what, what works and what doesn't. I'm committed to trying. I want to keep trying to figure it out. I want to be in dialogue with other people who have shared values and are committed to figuring out. But I think not being rigid and being willing to engage in these conversations and constantly reworking your views on things and how you see your role in struggle is something that I just really, really value. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think any time you write something, and especially I suppose I wrote mine quite quickly, to be honest. So there's always things that you kind of look at and you're like, oh, did I say that? But no, I, I don't know. I think the thing about evolving thought is that you don't always recognize it's evolved. And then you sort of look back at, at yourself sort of five years and you're like, oh, was I really saying that then? And so I, I was... I'm open to that journey. Like, I don't know that there's one thing I would say, oh, I should have said this or I shouldn't have said this or I would say this now. But I just think my experience with writing is that over time, you know, sometimes you look back and you're surprised by yourself. You're like, oh, cool. I was saying that like 10 years ago. I was consistent. And sometimes you look back and are sort of shocked that you, know, you always thought you were so radical, but you're saying like some neoliberal stuff and like that you've moved along. So I just think, yeah, my hope for myself is that I continue to to grow and stay open as a thinker and that you know, you don't harden into your ideas. I'm always scared of like, you know, becoming a crank. <laughs> you know, like you see people just get fixated on one kind of experience or idea and then your thinking revolves around that. So I think as we get older, we have to, you know, push ourselves to stay flexible in our thinking and not center our particular hurts or 
feelings that we've had of, I think it can be hard. Like if you feel that people have treated you badly or you've been excluded or something, your thoughts can start to revolve around that in particular ways. So I think pushing your thoughts to be generous and open is really important, I think, especially in feminist thought. Resisting a lot of the intergenerational stuff, I think it's very easy to fall into the, like a, you know, the dismissal of younger people's thoughts, and I think that's really important to to honor the thoughts of younger people and be open to changing our own ideas. So I I just hope for that, like a long thinking journey that I don't harden into my thoughts. But in this particular book, I mean, I don't know. Like I've had I probably yeah, if I was writing it now, would I write the same thing? Probably not. But you know, I think in the moment I was responding to what spoke to me and I was just, you know, grateful to be involved in that kind of dialogue and, you know, be coming in and, and have my voice there. So. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you both for coming on and talking with us uh, about this, this work. It's brilliant. And I really enjoy reading through it. And I know Jay did as well, but before we let you go, is there anything else you you wanted to shout out or say or share in, in closing? I mean, I would just say thank you for inviting us to have this conversation. It's, you know, I'm part of the sort of ongoing changing, you know, being open to changing how you think about things or revisiting stuff that you've done in the past, I think is something, at least personally, I don't always do. So this gave me an opportunity to sort of go back and reflect on the process and reflect on what I wrote and having the opportunity to talk things through um, with you folks and Al was really nice. Yeah, um, we hadn't talked in fact, because yeah, I mean, I wasn't, exactly. <laughs> no, I wasn't part of, so uh, there was more dialogue. We, I sort of really uh, at the last edition, like just for the intro. So I hadn't had a chance to meet Tammy. So it was really nice. And I really enjoyed reading your piece and having the opportunity to engage with it and think about the different stuff and push my own thoughts around it too. So I think it's quite courageous to write a piece and then literally have all these people weigh in in the same book. And I mean, virtually launches some critiques and that can be very difficult. You know, it's like we always put our work out there and then want to be precious about it. So I think it's a very generous and courageous way of thinking to to sort of open up your work to this kind of multiplicity of voices and disagreements. So there are many, many, of course, like it's a great work. So many years of agreement, but I think it's also difficult um, it can be difficult to be like, oh, is this person saying this thing about my work too? So I think it, it's a real model too of of collective thinking and feminist dialogue and not being protective and precious of our words and, and allowing them to sort of do what they will. So Tammy, I think that took a lot of generosity and courage. So thank you. I think the, you know, dis, dis, disagreement and critique, if you can sort of not take it personally or sort of step away from things around ego, I think just can be incredibly you know, constructive and can be really productive. And that's really what pushes ideas and practices along. And, you know, to be honest, I, I was just flattered to, um, Butch was briefing anything that I wrote. Being critical or not, I was just like, oh, wow, I feel so nice. Like, you know, that's great that she's doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, all of that. I mean, I think, you know, it's one of the things we try to to kind of hold as a principle, even within our study groups, right? Of like, it's really useful for us to to disagree on things and do it in a way that's generous and generative, right? Like it's just, it's, that's how we sharpen our thinking. And I think this book is a, is a wonderful model of, of that and of kind of how, you know, we can look at these issues and, and reflect together and, you know, find areas of agreement of disagreement of how we're going to proceed together you know and so anyway thank you both this has been wonderful and we really appreciate the work thank you thank you so much for this uh, conversation and for going so in depth with the work as well thank you